Well, good morning. This is so beautifully weird. Thrilled to see you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful for, for today we get to do this. We don't have any guarantees of tomorrow in any form or fashion, but we do know that God is always present where we are, and I'm thrilled to be with you again. Four months of sitting on a stool recording in an empty room is just not the same thing. So know that as I've been saying, or we've been saying all along, we've been missing you. We're grateful to get to do this together today. Thank you for coming out with us. We know that there are plenty of those folks who aren't either able or ready to be back yet, and certainly we understand, and lots of grace and prayers and connection still to those folks. So obviously this is a bit different, which means ultimately um, not just are we distanced, but I, I, I appreciate your willingness to wear the mask. For us, this is uh, about loving our neighbor. It's about saying ultimately everybody who walks here, in here deserves that we do our best to care for them, to care for the other. And so I know that it's not comfortable if you wear glasses. I hate that my glasses fog up. I'm gonna look into, there's gotta be some kind of anti-fog thing out there. If you know, I think there should be, and so I'm gonna look. If I find something, I'll let you know. But we're thrilled that you're with us today, that you come to worship. We'll ask, let me just reiterate what we've said sort of online. The, the highest, one of the two highest risks things for churches to do when they gather, besides obviously we social distance from where we sit, is to sing. Because when you sing, you project the, from the area of your throat where the bacteria of the virus hangs out, you project sort of exponentially the amount of that air and those droplets as they talk about those into the air. And so that's why for us the safest way to love our neighbor who is in proximity to us is even with masks, not to sing. I know that for many, if not all of you, that's a really hard ask. Um, and so to help, help us stay on track with that, we won't even show lyrics, um, but to ask you to continue to just reflectively listen and uh, participate with in worship, looking for, praying for, longing for the day when that's no longer the necessity. Uh, but in the meantime, loving our neighbor and uh, continuing to just experience the presence of God and the ability to be in the room with others. So we want to, we're grateful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus, for that. So as you are here with us today, uh, then right where you are, worship with us the God who is present as we lift him up. Uh, it's the one who is the way, the truth, the life. Hang on a second, Kelly. Let me try this over. <laughs> Get the right capo. All right, give it a shot. Through every heartbreak, through every battle, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, I believe that you are. You are the one new 
on my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on I've been thinking about being able to gather with all of you yes. since March 15th and what this would feel like, what it would be like to look in your eyes. And I love it. Yes. So I'm really yes. excited. There's a lot going on in the world, and um, I don't know exactly what you're bringing in through these doors this morning, but you are here and you are loved, and that is good. And we serve a God who is good and who loves us and who is with us. So we're going to do like we normally do, and we're going to stand and we're going to greet each other, but today it's so special because we get to look in each other's eyes. So even though you can't hug, um, do the air hug, air high five, but take a second and look in each other's eyes because it is a blessing to be able to see our new song family. So would you take a second, stand, turn to each other. going to be like the longest greeting in the world. <laughs> Just going to give you a second. So Kelly led the way. If, if during this song one of us starts crying, then you just got to have just some grace. Go. We were rehearsing this next song, and I lost it in rehearsal. So we're going to try to keep it together, because <laughs> God is good, and God is, yes. as the song says, he is with us always. Every heart that 
What a four months it's been. And I think in so many ways, it just becomes clearer and clearer of how important community is. To be there with each other, to lift each other up, to hold space for one another. I know for, for Michaela and I, that's been huge for us. The texts, the calls, the prayers, the flowers, the cards. And it makes me think of Paul writing to the church in Galatia, where he says, bear one another's burdens. Bear each other's burdens. And therefore, fulfill the law by doing so. And that, that in so many ways, has been our experience. And I know that that is what's needed for probably all of us on some level, especially over these last four months where we don't know what tomorrow will look like, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know that today we have, and today we're here, and today we're together, and so that today we can bear one another's burdens. And so, as a way of just continuing to worship, but in worship in a way of, of engaging and participating uh, and, and not just to sit and reflect, and, uh, but to also engage with what God, what the Spirit, what the divine is doing here and now and today. Um, for us to move into this time of, of communal prayer, uh, of, of, of prayers of the people that... Um, for each of us to have an invitation to share our prayer requests, for you to share your prayer requests just from where you're sitting. You don't, don't feel like you have to stand up or walk anywhere, but just right where you're sitting to be able to, to voice it 
And then for us collectively as a church, as a family, as the body of Christ that is gathered today, from, from here in person and at home, um, for all of us to be able to say in response, Lord, hear our prayer. Because it's our prayer that your burdens are my burdens. And that by being a part of the church, my burdens are your burdens. And so we lift each other up and we pray with and for each other. So it's not just one person's struggles, but it's ours. It's our prayer. And then after a period of silence, I'll quickly close it before the sermon. And so I'll start and then collectively we'll all respond with, Lord, hear our prayer. For Michaela and I, in our miscarriage that we had a, a few weeks ago, Lord, hear our prayer. 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 Hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. for all of our prayers said and unsaid. Lord, hear our prayers. Well, this is a beautifully strange experience. What a joy to be here. It's weird because of all the obvious realities. It's weird for me because it's, I've never in my life been four months without <laughs> being in church. And, and yet some of that was good, if I'm honest, to be able to sit and watch a service with my grandbaby in my lap or running around the room was a joy. Um, new rhythms coming, and I want to talk about some of that today. I want to say 
ultimately stepping back into the opportunity to do this, to, to teach after a number of weeks off, but also to be able to gather and do that here with, with my New Song family is a joy. And I want to say thanks to Pastor Grant for uh, walking us through uh, his series over the last few weeks or the insight broad, because some of that is really appropriate to what I want to talk about today as we begin to meet, as we look to the future and continue to wrestle with on some level that reality that, uh, as he talked about, God's turning sort of our circumstances, God bringing us, forging us from water into new wine, and the way he does that in our past and present and future, that he brings something new, that he refreshes that, re-energizes that, gives new life, that ultimately this is a, a moment that I will remember. And I'm grateful for that. Because all we have, right, is the present to live in it. And yet with that come, come realities, realities that we've prayed about today, realities then that engage our daily lives and thoughts about tomorrow, and yet here we are. And it so his, his series was helpful even as I was reflecting on, on sort of where to go uh, today with this. Because it, it helped me and hopefully us then today understand how to navigate the questions or uncertainties or challenges that aren't just here today, but we know as the prayers are lifted up are, are looming for any of us in all kinds of ways. It reminded me as I was thinking about this of the story of Joseph in, Genesis, in the book of Genesis beginning in 37 to 50, and maybe this will give you an opportunity to go back and revisit it. But most of us, if not all of us, know the story, right? I mean, Joseph is son of Jacob, who's son of Abraham, or son of Isaac, who's son of Abraham, and Joseph is number 11 of 12 kids. And the story we often remember is essentially Joseph is the one who gets the coat of many colors. Uh, at least Dolly Parton reminds us of that because she had one sort of like that as she tells us in her song. Ultimately, Joseph is a pretty significant character in Hebrew faith in the Old Testament story. As we see in Joseph then, really this, this meta-narrative, this larger story where we can all find ourselves even today, we can see that Joseph is this, in the specifics for his story, Joseph is brother number 11, but he's sort of, uh, if, we, if you really look, at to, look into the text, you see that Joseph is a bit of a brat. And he's had a kind of a good life. He gets the coat. Nobody else does, not even baby brother. And he has this sort of attitude, uh, as even as he's learning to understand who he is and use sort of the spirit of God working in him, he doesn't always do it wisely. So as you know the story, at some point, his brother's out in the field, and he sent out to give him a message. They're just sick and tired of little brother. They beat him up, throw him in a hole. And, and that's where I felt like this is, I, I think I can kind of relate to that part of it. Because in many ways, isn't this like a hole where we landed and we can't see sort of what happens tomorrow? All of what the future is is up for grabs. The forced reality to say that's how life always is. It's just now we don't have any choice but to say what I have is the present. And all I have about for tomorrow is hopes and questions and uncertainties. And I think that's part of life and important. And so what I want to talk about simply today and is essentially that in circumstances like these, the reminder that life can change in a moment. And we all know that. We're all experiencing that. It's not new information. But as, we, as it does, as it does, and it will keep changing in weeks and months to come, there's essentially two ways that you can see that, two ways, two lenses that we can look through the present reality we live in. And that could be understood then as a, we can see it as, we can see this moment, these days, as interruption, or we can see them as disruption. Two primary ways to see it, and they're both very different if you understand what they mean. And the lens that you choose will make all the difference in the journey and the outcome. I think about when I think of Joseph, that without even knowing it, as we do, maybe not thinking about it that way, it's why I wanna just sort of elevate that idea, is Joseph is in this pit and he literally has no idea of what's gonna happen the next day. He has no idea what's going to happen in the future. He certainly wouldn't have predicted he would end up second in command in the kingdom, in the empire of Egypt. And Joseph is the one, maybe you've heard the verse quoted, what, God, what man intended for evil, God intended for good. That was Joseph's story. Hindsight comments about his life as he looked back and drew the work of God in his life, leading him to this point where he could rescue his family, which ultimately then means the rescue of the nation of Israel, the people of God. And so we can look at and read the story and say, oh, that's really cool. 
But it begins with a guy in a pit who has no idea what's going to happen. The rug's been pulled out from under him, and he has a choice about what lens he's going to look at his life through, at his present through. And the lens you choose makes all the difference in the journey and outcome. And here's the truth. There's always a lens. There's always a lens. We're always framing our life from some perspective, especially when we're talking about then and the here and now. We always see it through some lens. And the difference between interruption and disruption, essentially, is interruption is based on the question. It raises the question. It seeks the goal of, how do I get back to normal? How do we get back to life as it was pre-COVID? How do I get back home with that beautiful coat and sort of forgive my brothers and life just gets back to normal when I don't know that they hate me so much they want to kill me. That's the question. The essential question of interruption is that. The question of disruption is a bit different. The question when the lens, and there's always a lens, is disruption. The question is this. What's the present reality that I'm in? What's true? What's real about what, where I am, the present? And what's the next right step? What's the next right step? What do I do with that? And all of us, all of us are facing these realities in some dimension. You know, Sean, as you mentioned, others mentioned, I've got three teachers in my family. Lots of conversations happening. Shelly, Caleb, Michaela, all teachers. Lots of conversations happening about, so what's school going to do? What's your district talking about? How are we going to do this? Lots of parents. I'm confident having the same kinds of questions because there's so much at stake. Let alone sort of the exposure to virus, education. So at stake ultimately, in the worst case scenario, is death. For any and everybody involved, the realities of the risk for anybody and everybody involved. And so there are businesses struggling to make it, businesses that haven't made it. There's daily living for you and I, decisions to make about how we interact with all of that. Disruption says, what's the present reality? Ask the question, what is it? What's real about where I am here in this pit, here in this hole, rug pulled out from under me? And how do I take the next right step in light of what I know to be true here and now? with the wisest ability to try and say, this might be the next step. How do I lean into the Spirit's guidance? How do I lean into what I know to be true? Not just about the circumstances, but about the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Because one of these lenses, interruption, that question will lead to fear. How do we get back to what was normal? How do we go back to the good old days, right? We've all heard that, and maybe it feels a little bit more real at this point than it, than it has in the past. And it's a genuine, I mean, it's a genuine response. It's a human response to say, it felt good then. We're conditioned to do that. Why do battered women go back to abusive husbands? Because it may be dangerous, but at least I know what to expect. At least I know how to deal with that. The unknown is so far different. Interruption deals with the question, how do we go back to normal? Disruption deals with that other question, what's present reality? And it can fuel, if interruption fuels fear, disruption can, it doesn't happen automatically, but it can fuel faith. To say that I know, to sing with a sense of confidence. And when I talk about faith, I'm not talking about, well, you believe these things. Well, I hope so. I'm talking about faith as its, its deeper meaning, confidence and trust, that I have an experiential internal sense of this is good and right and true. And when I sing God with us, when I understand the scriptures promise that reality more than any other promise, that I'm choosing to take whatever next right step it is to internalize that into every dimension and every fiber of my being. That God is with us, and God is for us. And nothing can separate us. And I think that's what Joseph is thinking in the middle of this hole. It's like, all right, at least I know that God is with me. Because I, I, as a good Hebrew boy, Joseph gets, I mean, you can see that in a story. For at times, as bratty as he can be, and probably far more so than we see in the text, He's a young man who gets this God, the God of my people, the God of my ancestors, because Abraham's like he's in my line of family. So I know we have this story told of God's goodness to us because he brought Abraham, my ancestor, 
What is it, great-grandfather? I don't know. So Joseph's story is real. It's anchored in this real that he knows. The faith isn't just, well, I grew up hearing these things, so I believe them. It's anchored in a confidence that is true. And so the idea, the principle, the lens of disruption creates the opportunity for us to move forward and fuel our trust and confidence of the reality present always with us, that is God and his goodness to us. And it's trustworthiness then to begin to help us see what is the next right step for here, for now, in these circumstances, in my own story, what's the next right step? That's the Spirit's longing and job to do. So from the bigger picture then, in terms of new song, from the beginning, from the very first Sunday of our isolation, of our separation, inability to do this, we've strived not necessarily through the lens of Joseph, that was just something that, that I was thinking of this week, but we strive in, in every way we understood how to lean into that confidence and trust that we have, and the knowledge that God is with us and will guide us through this disruption, will guide us, not just individually, not just our families, but this church, the New Song family, through this disruption and giving us what we need, when we need it, to continue taking the next right step that will in time then shape new song into what it needs to be for the work he has in mind for us, for his kingdom story. That's the confidence. That's the trust. Because I, like all of us, I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. What I do know is that today God is still good, and it's not just a bumper sticker for me. That's the confidence from which I live. And sleep. So as we work through these things, basically we ask the kinds of questions as, in, to some degree, that are, that are opportune for the moment of disruption when you say, so we're here, and what do we do with this now? What is, the, what is the next right thing? So we've asked questions like, what are the practices and values and maybe traditions, the way we've done things before that used to meet the need back when it was normal, back in pre-COVID days, but we can't do now? What are the kinds of things then that that aren't working now, that don't, don't do that, that we can't do or that don't work? What are the kinds of things that we need to evaluate, to hold in our hands and say, so in terms of how we do and move and connect and communicate and worship and engage each other as, as believers, what are the ways in which we can't do it anymore? What needs to be replaced? What's, what is the thing that's new that needs to be born in order to continue to move us towards engagement? What values, what truths are emerging even in the midst of all that we can't do or all that is no longer possible that the new normal is shaping, what truths and values are emerging that are foundational, that we hold on to, even if the experience or practice of those evolves in the days, weeks, months, even years to come? Where does something completely new need to be born? In terms of how we are called to shape and to form and to to live in and have the kingdom live through us, what could be the thing that is the next way for us to engage each other, for us to be present to each other, for us to worship together, for us to find the sense of our participation, not just individually, but as a family in what God is doing in the world here and now. And we have these, we've been having these conversations, trying to, trying to keep sort of the wheels turning, at the same time trying to imagine with great excitement while at the same time, great stress, like everybody else. Sort of, oh, these are the challenges, here are the realities, what can we do? These are the questions we're asking. It's kind of like having a garage sale. So the reality is, it, maybe all of us, most of us have had a garage sale, been to a garage sale. I certainly know, we all know what a garage sale is. We used to live in Holiday Shores until we moved to town about four years ago. And so uh, Holiday Shores every year, as some of you may know, uh, has an annual garage sale. I don't know if they're doing it this year or not. Daryl, Kathy, they are, they are doing it. Okay, so it's, it's a big, big deal. And so ultimately, so our family, essentially, we had understood. Essentially, we're not like huge into that. But the garage sale, it's like a garage sale because what you do when you're going to prepare for a garage sale is you're asking yourself the question to some degree, what is it that I have that really doesn't serve its purpose anymore? Or it's worn out. It needs to be replaced or it needs to be just sort of gotten rid of. And some other person is going to buy my junk and I'll take the money and go to somebody else's garage sale and buy their junk and the recycling happens. 
But we used to approach it like, if we could just make this much money on this garage sale, then we, that stuff can go to somewhere else. It can get replaced with this new stuff. Like if the sofa is outdated, it's still good, we can sell it. And hopefully between selling that and a couple of our kids, we can make <laughs> enough to get a sofa that's new again and fresh, and it'll change, the, you know, we can, or we can get rid of the sofa and get armchairs. Do we need to redesign the look of the house? Do we need, do we need, is it, are we due, are we needing a vacation and don't have enough money? If we could get at least this much, we could get a jump on that. And those were always the thoughts. And so, again, we would do it. And then at the end, by and large, much of the time, not all the time, it was like, all right, we got pretty close to what we hoped for, so we can do what we wanted to. But you're doing the same thing. You're taking these things that are important to you, that have value, that are tied then to some, some way of measuring that and saying what needs to be replaced, what needs to be uh, let go of completely, what new thing then needs to replace that thing that I'm trading off to someone else. And it's kind of that approach. And so as we wrestle with this question, here are some of the, the realities that have surfaced again for us as, as critical and true and real realities that we, that we hold on to and anchor. And it is ultimately not, this isn't brain surgery information, it's not new information, but we had this conversation early on. We have to remember the church is people. And I'm supremely grateful for the building, and especially again today, to be able to have a place outside of the heat where we can gather and see each other and be present in the same room as God's Spirit is here with us, doing what the only Spirit can do to stir up our sense of this is, this is good, this is beautiful. But the reality is the church, even in its original language, the definition is, about, is a conversation about people and not buildings. And so we will use the building, we will benefit from the building for as long as we can because there's great joy and blessing in having it. But it led to this sort of the second idea, but the reality is that our lives as Christ followers are 24-7. And if I look back to what's normal, the truth is the easiest thing in the world is to think that my Christian life revolves around what happens one hour on Sunday in a specific place. Which then by default, even with the best intentions, can easily swing into, so the rest of life is life. But I go to church and I get re-energized, I get reconnected, all is good and all that's true. I'm not saying that as a negative thing. What I'm saying is, is it possible that for some of us, that experience ultimately was sort of this place that I identified as that happens here, it happens on this day, at this time, in this location. And I expect that to be, you know, good, just like everybody loves going home. That's a good experience, but it's not intended to be the whole thing. Our life as Christ followers isn't intended to hinge around one hour in a certain place. It's a 24-7 thing. And so we're, we're raising those questions saying, what does it look like then in the midst of the inability to be in the building, to connect, to engage, to reach out, to form and do ministry in ways that leverages the technology available to us and allows us then to be connecting with people? What could that look like? And so those are the questions we're continually asking. We'll keep asking to do that. Because we know that God is with us, guiding us through this, and wants us to be connected. And this is sort of, it, it leads, so as we talk with folks then, ultimately, we realize that essentially that we, we realize basically pretty early on that this experience doesn't, doesn't necessarily need to revolve around Sunday morning. Because from the beginning, we've been uh, live streamed for a couple of weeks. That fell apart pretty quickly when every other church in town tried it. And so we went to pre-recorded. And just as a matter of, of note, by the way, now, today we're live streaming as a test. Nobody else knows. Actually, the 915 people that watch the 915 service know because I told them. But you know, we didn't advertise it, but the goal is to test it today and moving forward, basically, to do just that. We'll live stream this particular service, so if you can't be here, you can still see the live stream service. And like the pre-recorded, it'll be on YouTube from here on out. So you can, if you missed one, you can choose which one you want to go back to and watch. Again, trying to say what's available to us, how do we, in the present, engage engage our family of faith in ways that is meaningful to them. In the conversations along the way, what we found out, both in conversation, that we got plenty of people saying, like I did a few minutes ago, you know, Sunday was kind of a nice thing. Actually, realizing the Sabbath isn't a suggestion for a reason. The staff, we talked about sort of, it feels like in some ways, we, we got to get off of the, squir got out of the squirrel cage for a while. And there's respite. And that's good and healthy. I mean, this is our job, and we get that. But we had plenty of conversations with some of you that said, you know, it's kind of nice not 
But to have to get up and gather the kids and run on Sunday morning and in reflection are saying to some degree, it feels like when I think about it, Sunday morning for our family with several kids and a distance to drive or all the other plans of the day could easily feel like it's just another hamster wheel of its own. And less like rest and more of a thing we rush and rush and rush and do and then we go on about our day in life. And so these truths emerge as we begin to talk about what does it look like then to see this differently. We're not giving up Sunday morning service, obviously. We're just recentering what's at the heart of why it's good and saying, well, I'm, I'm so glad. We looked at YouTube the first few weeks. We got several hundred people, and then it drops off dramatically, which is natural. People are curious. People are excited, and they're busy. But then we began to notice a trend that by the end of the week, sort of there were, there were a few on Sunday, a few on Monday. By the end of the week, just about the same amount of people were watching. And it's, so it's gone up and down since then. But it, one of those measures of which we could see, oh, people really are able to hopefully enjoy the Sabbath, as they're telling us, and then they either on their own or with family sit down on Monday night or when they get home from work on Thursday or Saturday afternoon before they sort of, as they're moving into the weekend. And I, I'm grateful for technology that allows us to do that, to help decenter sort of the expectation that the right way to do it is you have to be present in one place together. And it's a good and beautiful thing. I mean, our family loved, and my family is there today in order to sort of create some space so that every, other folks could be here watching sort of, Shelly and Caleb are the only ones that know about the live stream, and they're watching now, and we'll give us some feedback when we get home. But we enjoy that. Sabbath wasn't a suggestion for a reason. It's a priority in the pace of life to say somewhere, sometime, I have to have a time to just slow down. Here's probably the, of the truths what we've discussed, this is probably the key one. Pastor Lindsay was watching a webinar, a seminar online, I believe, and in the context of walking churches through what do we do in the middle of this, one of the speakers said, if content is king, meaning if what you have to say, whether that's Kingdom City, Children's Ministry, and here's what we want the kids to see, here's how they interact, and we've got videos online that follow our live services for that, or our recorded services for that reason. How do we deliver kids' ministry when it's virtual? If content is king, in other words, it matters a whole lot, and it does, if that's true about content, engagement is emperor. Far more important than just delivering content is connecting with people, is helping people know we're with you. And we may be distanced, but we're in this together. And we see you. Moving forward, at least for the future that it's sustainable, in, in that conversation, I've realized it's important for me to do the pre-recorded, just me and a camera. Because I heard from just a few people, but I feel it's important. It's a way for me to engage a camera, rather than them watch what's happening as I talk to you in a room. And that will, that will be the 915 service for the foreseeable future. Unless at some point we realize it's, it's not sustainable in terms of the resources going into that. And we'll keep, we'll keep sort of analyzing that. Because if content is king, engagement is emperor, it matters. It matters to us that we're trying to find ways and encouraging you to do the same to stay connected. That we're in this together even if we can't be present in the same room like we used to be. God is always working to bring about a greater experience, you see, in the engagement side of this, experience and expression of his kingdom. We talk about that as shalom. And the truth is, sometimes that emerges through disruption. It did for Joseph. Joseph's story became what it was because of the disruption in his life. And because if I were to talk to him and told him what I'm thinking of how to see this, he might say, yeah, that's probably what I did. I saw that as disruption instead of interruption. I wasn't longing, maybe for a bit, but I wasn't expecting for life to go back as normal. I knew that was gone. It didn't mean all of it was bad. It just means what I do with the present reality I have now, and I can have confidence in the God who is with me. It's been said that history repeats itself. I would argue history maybe the better way to see is history moves in cycles. And it's, and it's true, historically, as humankind adapts to change to the changing world, so the Spirit has guided the church through its own series of garage sales. Phyllis Tickle, a church historian who passed away a few years back, talked about as 
the church has every 500 years a rummage sale. Same, same thing, different word. Where the church at points in history has said there's a disruption in the middle of what's happening and it isn't maybe framed like COVID is, this once in our lifetime experience. It didn't come just because of a global pandemic. It came because the church was sensing, the church global was sensing something is, is changing, is different. And so they asked the question to some degree, what are the traditions, the values, the practices, the doctrines, the rituals that we've practiced that no longer do what they were intended to do? They work for a time, but they don't work now. And God is doing what God does. And that's something new. He's bringing us to some next stage of the journey into an experience of his presence and the life within the kingdom of God. And so the tools we have, the systems we've had, to some degree may be working, but it's time to look at those and see how do we keep tweaking and changing and letting go of what doesn't work and taking hold of what might be new and moving through that. And it's always disruptive. It has been. An important part of understanding the nature and history and reality of the church for then and for today. So quickly walk you through what those were, just in case you want to go back and explore this a bit. Obviously, the church, as we talk about it, then launches in the book of Acts with sort of following Jesus. And so ultimately, we're talking about about 500 years later, in the year 451, actually, is the first garage sale, fruit basket turnover, whatever you want to think of it, as rummage sale of the church. When the council gathers, this is post-Acts, obviously several hundred years. By this point, Constantine, as emperor of Rome, has institutionalized and politicized the church, and so we now have the church official. The Christian church becomes the church of the state, and with that then, this alliance with power and politics, and it changes the face and nature and direction of the church literally forever to this point in history. And so they gather in 451, and they're, and they're asking questions like, so what of what we're doing is working, what is not working? And they began to change it. They changed it as much as they felt like they possibly could. Change is hard always. And they made some changes under Emperor Marcy, and they made some changes. And so following that, they wrestled with the imperialization, the institutionalization, the pursuit of power and politics within the church. And so they made some adaptations and about 500 years later, 1054, was called the Great Schism, where the Eastern Church and the Western Church separated. And so we have the Eastern Orthodox faith, and this is where it divided, because the East went East and the, and the West went West. And so the main lines, the Protestants all went sort of at that point, separated. And so the Western Christian Church and the Eastern Christian Church have very different practices, very different, in some ways, very different beliefs, very different experiences of how they do the Christian life. And they divided over, they split over things like, what's, what's the source of the Holy Spirit? The argument is, is it actually originating from the Father? Is it originating from the Son? And so they, they fight over that. They fight over the jurisdiction of the Pope. How much power should he have, and how does this work? And, so, and then they fight over the most important thing is, should we have leavened or unleavened bread in communion? And they do what human beings typically do. They disagreed and went their own way. Still to this day, there's a separation and, and big differences in terms of expressions and experiences of how they do faith, life in the walk with God. 1517 is the one we know most about where Martin Luther Leads it, opens the door, then historically as you look back, and a lot of it moving up to that, but Martin Luther is the one who's the sort of key factor. He goes uh, to the church at Wittenberg and nails the 95 Theses, so history tells us. And again, argument, lots of arguments with the Catholic Church at the time trying to say this isn't working, some of this isn't good, some of it needs to be let go, something new needs to happen, and much came out of what then we know as pro the Protestant Reformation. Primarily, Martin Luther, the big one that, that is often understood or, or uh, people are aware of, is he's challenging the practice of the Catholic Church of selling indulgences. Pay for pray. You got enough money, then we can pray your relatives out of purgatory. So he had a problem with that, and among other things. And so the next fruit basket turnover happens. We celebrated that three years ago. It's 500th anniversary. I believe with everything in me, the church is raising questions about what is it we need to hold on to, the church global. What is it we need to hold on to? What's changing here? And I don't think it hinges around COVID. I just think COVID happens to be sort of a season in which we get this. We're forced to grapple with these kinds of questions in our own lives 
And I think it's a good place to say, especially for those of us trying to lead in faith, to say, what is this? What decisions are we making today going to impact us, not just two weeks from today, two months from today, two years from today, but 50 years from today, 70 years from today? I believe these are core times to be asking those questions. What is it that we need to hold on to? What is it that's new that needs to be born? What is it that needs to be adapted and tweaked just a bit in order to give space for the Spirit to do what the Spirit needs to do to shape us and guide us into who He wants us as a church to become? And then us individually and our families as part of that. To grapple with, to wrestle with, to experience the presence of God, our life in the kingdom of God, present here and now, it's, what we all, it's always what's central underneath everything we're saying and doing around here. For me, for us, with all the challenges that COVID brings and the decisions needed for the practical realities of the day, the anticipation of what these decisions will look like and how they'll tweak and change and shape us, I believe 20 years from now, maybe sooner, how the church lives and moves in the world and looks and what people call normal will be so different than it is now, than it has been for decades, if not centuries. I believe it. And so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about seeing what can this become as this forced time out forces us to ask these kinds of questions. I lean into that. We lean into this with hope and trust and confidence that I can't see out of this pit now. I don't know what God is doing. I do know that he's turning water into wine. And we can have that lens. Moving forward, it comes with a lot of hope. So we'll continue to covet your prayers, to continue to ask for your prayers as we're making decisions literally week by week trying to figure out how to do what we can do, what we can envision to do, what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be left behind as a means of keeping content as king but engagement as emperor to seek to know how to be with you, how to keep you and I centered, our hearts and our eyes and ears on the God who is with us, who is good, who in spite of the circumstances, when they're dark and dreary and difficult, is still with us in that hole saying, hang on, walk with me, trust me, lean into me. I've got you. All you need to know is what to do in the next right step. And we'll continue to ask for grace as we do that. There's there's no guarantee that two months from now, two weeks from now, we won't be saying we can't meet again in person for a while. And it'll bring its challenges and disappointment. We'll do the best we can do to try and continue to stay connected while at the same time doing all we know how to do to try and keep all of us safe in the experience as well. So we all need lots of grace. The core principle underneath all this is always... The top two, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. They guide us into even how we prepare the room and what we ask you to do as we gather in this place. It's driven by how do we love our neighbor. Because there's a thing I want to do and how I want to engage it, but if it runs any risk whatsoever of being detrimental to my neighbor, then biblically I'll take a step back and say, but this isn't about me. And that's the grace we all need for each other. But I'm excited about the days ahead. Not because I think they're all going to be good from a circumstance perspective. I think they'll be good when we look back and say, wow, look at God's hand here and here and here. And we did this thing. It was new. Who would have thought? But look how powerful it is, how God is moving. I mean, even to think about that, we have families that are sitting at a park on a Sunday morning now and catching a podcast or or a video of a service later. And they're sitting with their kids and enjoying God's creation and saying, God is so good, and there's a refreshing that's happening in their lives, a Sabbath experience they haven't experienced in a long time. It doesn't mean they won't be back here, maybe from time to time. Who knows what the new normal will be? That's not the point. The point is we're here in the present, and there's great hope because we have great confidence in the God who is good, the God who is with us, who longs to grow us into the image of Christ and through us to bring his kingdom to bear here in the world today. So I want to start next week a series based on probably the most well-known psalm, Psalm 23. A psalm for many of us, a psalm of comfort. It's most often heard at funerals for good reason. 
because we need something comforting when we're experiencing the valley of the shadow of death. But it's not the whole thing the psalm offers. I think the psalm offers much more than that. Psalm, this psalm offers us some insight into how to live a life of confidence and hope in the midst, without fear, without worry, in the midst of a global pandemic. Well, Psalm 23 offers some insight into that. So next week, we'll launch with that. I'm grateful for the opportunity to continue to do this journey with you. I won't take for granted that today we get to be together. Because today is all we have. But God is good. This is beautiful. I'm grateful to get to do life with you. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful that the songs we sing about your goodness, if we're present even in the song itself, letting the words wash over us, they can keep drawing us into an experience of the truth underneath them, that you are good, that life with you is a blessing that you are with us, that you are for us, that you are on our side. And we thank you for all of this, for the opportunity to gather today, and for what's in store tomorrow, next week, next month, and that we get to do this journey together. We give you praise, give you the glory for all of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.